My name is Les, Les Orgain. I'm a Hampton Master Gardener with the city of Hampton. Um, we actually operate out of Bluebird Gap Farm. I've been a Master Gardener for eight plus years. Uh, my prior life be before becoming a Master Gardener had nothing to do with gardening. It was an electrician, shipboard electrician in the Navy. Um, it's just what I like to do now. Uh, but we're um, concerned about the food web because and now I'm trying to, the screen's messing me up. All right, now you should see seeing the food web. All right. Um, but the food web starts with the plants. Plants feed the insects, small animals. Small animals feed larger animals. Larger animals feed the apex predator. And on top of this would be man. You know, ultimately, you know, there'd be cows and goats and lambs and sheep in there. And, you know, it's where we get our meat that for us to choose to eat meat. Um, but the example I'm talking about is the monarch butterfly, where it's so important for native plants or uh, not just monarch butterflies, but the, I want to say it is the black swallowtail butterfly. Uh, it's, a, it's a swallowtail, I'm not sure if it's the black swallowtail, but it specifically hosts on the pawpaw tree, which is a native tree in this area. Um, you get rid of the pawpaw trees, or we cut down, and there's, there's nothing there for those adult swallowtails to lay their eggs on. Um, then they basically are going to go extinct. And that's what's so important about native plants. Um, the butterflies in their larval stage, after they lay their eggs, um, and they hatch out of the eggs, their, their larva, they're eating on the plant that they're laid on. And butterflies just can't lay their, their eggs on any plant. Um, specifically, the monarch has to lay their eggs on milkweed. Um, if it lays it on a tomato, which which they won't, if it lays on a tomato, the egg's going to hatch and the larva is going to die because it will not eat tomato leaves. Uh, it has to be a milkweed plant, whether it be swamp milkweed, rose milkweed, prairie milkweed, um, balloon milkweed. It, it doesn't matter. It could be a tropical milkweed like balloon milkweed, but that's not a native plant. Um, swamp milkweed is for, for our area. Um, and believe it or not, there's many insects like that that have sole plants that they, that, that they require in their life cycle. Now, when it becomes an adult and goes through the metamorphosis process, uh, the monarch can get nectar and from any flowering plant that provides nectar. It doesn't have to be solely from milkweed. Um, but if we eliminate the milkweed, which is the problem the monarchs are having right now, um, you eliminate their birthing ground, so to speak, um, for the next generation. Um, if you follow it in the news, one of the problems they're having with uh, the monarch is because they are a migratory butterfly. They, they come all the way north up into Canada. And eventually, like I think it's six generations of butterflies it takes to get to Canada, and then they migrate back down. Um, a lot of the cornfields and farmers, uh, a company called Monsanto has created uh, a corn that is, the corn seed can take uh, applications of glyphosate, which is basically Roundup. It's the chemical name for Roundup. So now they can spray these fields of corn with glyphosate and kill everything corn, well, one of the things that's happening is they're knocking out a lot of milkweed that grows up on the edges of the corn. Um, so hence with the Monarch Watch uh, organization, they've been very good at developing what they call Monarch Way Stations, where they get people to um, plant milkweed in certain sections in abundance. Because again, you don't want to just plant one plant because if 10, if 10 uh, butterflies come and lay their eggs, um, and I don't know the number, the, the, the correct number here, but let's say 10, 10 butterflies lay all, lays all their eggs in the, that one milkweed. Well, uh, when everything hatches, there's going to be nothing left for them and then to eat, so they'll never go through their whole larval stage and pupate into and then metamorphosis into a butterfly. So um, the, the purpose of the waste station is to create an abundance of food 
that can support multiple um, butterflies uh, laying eggs in there. Uh, but in a nutshell, that is what's so important about native plants. Um, because of the, the uh, in the ecosystem, there's so many interdependent relationships. You know, you get rid of the, all those worms. Um, I've, I've read a article, and I don't have the article off the top of my head where it was, but it's probably in the Audubon Society website where we'll go to here later. But um, a brood of chicks uh, in a nest, you know, three or four birds, uh, it's like 900 to 1,000 caterpillars that it re is required to raise those chicks to um, adults so they can fly off and leave the nest. So if the butterflies aren't laying all their all their eggs, with the monarchs are unique because of their color coding, they uh, birds know that they'll get sick if they eat them because they're eating milkweed. But there, there's many other butterflies out there that lay their the hornworm caterpillar lays it's a moth that lays their eggs and eats your tomato plants in the, in the summer. Um, that's one a lot of people should be familiar with or cabin whites. Um, they are the little sulfur butterflies that have a little black dot on each wing and they love your um, broccolis and cauliflowers and kales and you know, the ones that you can't see them unless you're really digging down underneath the bottom of the leaf you're wondering what's going on with my plant something's eating it but you can't see it because they're very, they're very small but um, you know, if these birds don't have access to this food, well, then that means the bird population can decline. They decline. The eagles now, or the wolves in this case, uh, don't have access to it, or the rats. Well, the rats kind of eat pretty much anything, but um, eventually it will affect the food chain. And the, the rat would probably live better than most of the animals on here because they're much more adaptable. They're not very particular in their diet. But frogs are very specific. A lot of them are very specific in diet. Um, snakes would probably be good, but it, it's it is a uh, compounded effect as it goes up the food chain. Um, this is what the standard homescape looks like. Um, most people have a tree or two in the yard, it's a couple bushes, and. Um, either turf grass or, in a lot of cases, a mix of turf and weed grasses. The weeds are probably a native type of weed. Um, not necessarily, because there are some weeds that have been imported. Um, Japanese stilt grass is one. Um, so if you get the Japanese stilt grass, now that's an imported weed, you want to get rid of it um, if you can. Um, but this in and of itself, and this, and this, what we're looking at here, is not very supportive to that whole food web that we're talking about for natives. Um, I'm taking a guess, but I don't have a, uh, a good picture of that, but that might be a crepe myrtle to the right. And believe it or not, crepe myrtle is not a, a native tree and it supports absolutely zero native species. That turf grass, if that's the, oh, you got a nice tall fescue lawn, looks nice. Guess what? That monoculture, because uh, it's just nothing but grass, supports zero uh, native wildlife. Um, you know, you might have deer occasionally take a bite or two, but nobody's letting their grass grow to four feet, so it's it's really negligible for even deer. Uh, most people are chasing deer away with deer repellent and other things. Anyway, they got a nice yard. Um, I don't know what those what those bushes off to the left are, and I'm not sure what that large tree in the uh, Upper right over here is either. This looks like it might be another crepe myrtle back here, too. Now, don't get me wrong, crepe myrtles are very beautiful trees. Uh, I've had some in my yard down in Florida because they're so easy to take care of. That's like the state, the imported state tree for the state. Um, but again, they don't support any native wildlife. They're not from here. Um, so, um, what you will find is if you go shopping for plants, and most people will go to an Anderson's or a Lowe's or a Home Depot. Is they're not necessarily carrying natives; they're carrying what sells and what people want. And one of the one of the big pushes right now to edu is trying to get to educate people that hey, the, the big box stores and even a lot of commercial uh, nurseries are pushing what the public is buying. And that's not going to change unless we 
can get people to understand what the, the food web, how that food web works and that natives are, are better. Uh, I don't think anybody is advocating that you get rid of the crepe myrtles, but plant a pawpaw tree underneath that crepe myrtle, or you know, plant an oak, you know, an oak tree, a native oak tree for your area. Um, and you would help support some local um, insect. Which uh, I know everybody has a, you know, that's another big misconception. A lot of people don't like bugs. Uh, bugs are a fact of life. Um, bugs, without bugs, you're really taking out that, that it's like plankton in the ocean. You take away the plankton, the whole sea is going to suffer from a food standpoint. Um, you, you take away all the insects, the same thing's going to happen in, in a uh, ecosystem on land. Uh, they are, they are the building block for uh, everything else. Um, uh, here's another problem that's facing the the native uh, section is big developed communities. You know what might have been fields of uh, trees and bushes and uh, various plants. Um, anybody's ever been to the mountains and walked through the mountains and a, a preserve or someplace? You'll if you really pay attention, you'll see. 30, 40 different types of plants in a 100 foot section of, of a preserve. And again, again, they're trying to preserve it to keep it local for the biodiversity of the local community. Um, a lot of people say, why bother? Because you're going to cut down, they're going to cut everything down. Um, bottom line is every wildlife group, whether it be the bears, you know, bears used to be seen around here 40 years ago. You, Maybe every two or three weeks you hear about a bear. Um, you hardly hear about any bears anymore. I can't think of the last time I heard of a bear being in this area. But every every group of uh, wildlife is under pressure, whether it be bear, birds, insect, um, because we as as humans is, are we're expanding. We're taking away that habitat. Um, it's just something we need to be aware of. We need to do it. Uh, I guess smarter, more smartly than we have done in the past. Um, let's see. And here's some wildlife decline uh, numbers that uh, were pulled out. Um, you know, 19 nineteen percent of land birds have uh, declined, and you know, so for every hundred birds, nineteen of them have declined. And sure, some species have declined more, and others not so much, but. Um, it's just something to take account. Amphibians have taken a big hit, you know, 21 to 61%, depending on the area and uh, which amphibians you're talking about. Um, you know, this isn't uh, some, this data is not being gathered by some extreme right group. Uh, USGS is a government agency for, for the states. And yeah, it's, it's, amphibians are very, Unique to their environment, uh, reptiles you know ten to twenty percent decline. Um, World Wildlife Federation did a thing and said there was a uh, fifty nine percent decline ac across the whole world. So it's just not a it's not a Virginia problem. It's not a U.S. problem. It's a it, it, this is a world problem because the same things happening in uh, South America, Asia, you know Europe. Um, basically. Expansion and development is the name of the game. That's what's that's what we're fighting. Every road we put down, you know, and think about this: it's not just the road. The road's not taking away farmland; it's also taking away, or native land is taking away the ability for the land to recover from the water table too. So it's just another caveat that builds into the whole expansion and development of the country. Um, you know, Virginia supports has a. Uh, just a little picture here that shows that we have very diverse environments in uh, Virginia. Yeah, we have coastal uh, swamp swamp areas. We have uh, obviously the Chesapeake Bay, you know, the biggest bay area in the world, I believe. Um, uh, mountain, you know, the Piedmont area. Uh, we have dunes on the beaches. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, we got lots of uh, open fields and sections. Anybody that's been up and you know, taking a trip on Skyline Drive, the whole Piedmont mountain area, 
is just a beautiful place to, to look at. Uh, and then we have the whole coastal uh, section. Wetlands and estuaries, how uh, our whole coast being on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, you know, what's been done in the past is, you know, so that'd be a great view. Let's drain that area. Uh, let's uh, bring in a bunch of dirt, fill it in, make, make it a place to either put in business or homes. Or what we were doing at the time was we were eliminating all that natural native plant life there that is very unique to um, not just supporting um, animals by, by feeding them, but also by filtering the water and supporting the, the uh, animals that live in the bay. Um, yeah, it's, so you'll see a bunch of projects been going on to, you know, oyster bed replenishment, uh, wetlands, uh, this basically is a, kind of like a riparian buffer, which uh, helps absorb uh, high tide inrushes. It, it slows down the flow of water, believe it or not, these tall reeds. Um, it's not going to slow, slow down a tidal wave, but a, a, a inrush of water from like a hurricane, it, we have less of a dramatic surge effect with natural coastlines than with these riparian buffers than we do with um, developed property. Um, you know, just another picture of the, the many different, you know, we look at this and you might see a bird or two in, in real life. You'll see, you'll see the grass because it's going to be there and you're going to see the, see the lake. You're not going to see everything that's happening underneath the, the aquatic plants, the, um, you know, what all those plants on top do to help with the cranes and the ducks and uh, the raccoons. Um, you know, the coons are surviving by eating shellfish too, but um, it, it, we're all interconnected. Um, uh, rural agriculture, areas in agriculture. We got we got to feed people, so we're we're not going to change the fact that we have big farmlands. Um, interestingly enough, there is a facility opening up. I don't know if you saw it in the news here the last. Um, I think it was about a month ago. They're getting ready to open up a big indoor uh, farm facility up north towards Richmond, and. The great thing about indoor farm facilities, it may counteract the big spaces we need because they can get 13 crops instead of building. They're up to 13 crops depending on the crop they're growing. Where outside in the farm, let's say you have a, a crop like take broccoli, you do broccoli in the spring, you do broccoli in the fall. So you have all this land, you can only get two crops out of it. Well, vertical farming inside a facility where you're maintaining the temp, if you can get 13 crops out of it in a year. That might be the way in the future to maximize the use of land. Um, you know, not only are you growing more crops, you're actually, because you're growing vertical with LED lights and stuff, you're maybe limiting the impact we have to have on the environment by stripping down to put in a whole row, of, you know, fields of broccoli or fields of corn. Corn may be unique. Corn, we may have no choice because of the size of it, but um, just something to think about. Um, bottom line, if you put if you put in natives, um, expect to get native visitors. Expect to get the uh, bugs that you may not like. Expect to get uh, deer are going to come regardless, <laughs> um, unless you put a twelve foot fence around your property. A uh, six foot fence won't keep a deer out, um, but um, native moles will come. If, if you have the food there, if you have a good soil web good, that's supporting the worms and grubs in the area, because that's what they're digging for. Uh, but if, if you have grubs, if you have lots of grubs and worms, it means you have good soil, which means the native plants will, will, should thrive in uh, the environment. Is that somebody waiting? I'm going to stop the share real, real quick. No, it's not. Let me go back to the share screen. Um, Uh, and here's some of the things that I was talking about earlier about the bear. Hey, watch out, snakes are slithering in the warm weather. Well, that's what snakes do in the warm weather. State wildlife officials, uh, bear sightings up in Hampton Roads. Well, you know, they can't stay in the dismal swamp forever. You know, they, they, they're bound to occasionally wander out. I think that's probably where they're the only place around here. I know that bears are 
uh, wild anymore. Uh, foxes. I, I got foxes outside the back of my house over here uh, by NASA. Um, animal control, control getting reports of coyotes. Okay, I, these are all things that you know the, the way the news plays them up, thinking it's a bad thing. I think actually seeing snakes is cool. Now, until you are good at identifying a snake, um, don't get close to it because we do have three poisonous varieties in the area, or poisonous varieties in the area. Rattlesnake, uh, which should be pretty easy to see, uh, cottonmouths, and copperheads. Uh, but we got king snakes and black snakes and gardener snakes and many more in the area that are good for the, they're part of that food web feeding on rats and mice. Um, but the, the news, the way they portray it is like, this is a bad thing. Yeah, bear is not the best thing to see rolling by your garbage can. <laughs> it's not something I want to see, but. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so basically what I said earlier, we've got, we've got to educate people, be an advocate for it, we've got to educate the public and create wild wildlife friendly gardens, which is basically what native plants are doing. You're, you're creating uh, native habitat, providing native food for native plants. Uh, I, I was talking about my daughter earlier, uh, that I didn't finish this analogy that I like to use. Um, when she was young, she would only eat hot dogs or chicken nuggets. Well, I wasn't going to McDonald's all the time to eat dinner because that's all she would eat. I wasn't going to go to a place that had hot dogs all the time. So we routinely go to an Italian restaurant with a happy meal in hand. Uh, go into a steakhouse with a half a million. Um, well, unfortunately, you can't do that with wildlife. They, they've got to be able to have, you know, we chop down all the oak trees and we put a bunch of um, grape myrtles up. They look great. We just wouldn't have anything that the, the oaks, I think, support over 200 different varieties of uh, native insects slash animals. Um, it, it's just, I've I've personally never seen, I'm sure that there's crate myrtles out there, personally never seen a bird nest in a crate myrtle. Um, you know, they're not, they're kind of open trees, so they're not, don't provide protection inside a bunch of layer of leaves where a nest could be built to make it a safe habitat for a, for a bird to nest. So it's, it's not more, it's not just about feeding, it's also about the habitat side of it. it was what made us help with. Oh, look at that. Food, shelter, water, and adequate space. More or less what I just, just talked about. Uh, native plants uh, are naturally occurring in a particular habitat and uh, region of the, of the country. Um, now, we can get, uh, let's say, prairie milkweed. Prairie milkweed is native to North America. It's not native to our area. Um, it would help monarch butterflies if you decided to blow grow um, native or prairie milkweed in our area. I just don't think it would help anything else. Um, it would provide a landing spot for a monarch to lay her eggs and for the larvae to hatch and eat. But um, that's really not the kind of native we'd rather have. We'd, I personally rather you see. You have plant swamp milkweed, but if you're only going to plant, if you're only going to decide to plant milkweed and you want to plant prairie milkweed, there's nothing wrong with that. You're still helping an animal of some type. It's not, it's not as effective as planting a, a native plant. Um, uh, yeah, this is one I, I disagree with here. It says the aesthetic appeal and functionality. Native plants are not necessarily aesthetically pleasing all the time. Um, there's a lot of natives that bloom, but they only have like a two week bloom period. I think that's one of the reasons like the crick myrtle so popular because it will bloom and it has blooms for months. Um, uh, it, just something, uh, if you're a true naturalist, yeah, you may think that's an aesthetic appealing seeing native plants, but, but unfortunately most people are looking for that pop of color that uh, they want. So. Again, I'd, I'd rather take the road, hey, have an oak tree in one spot and a crepe myrtle in the other. That way you're having, you know, or a dogwood in one spot and a crepe myrtle. That way you're providing some kind of native plant uh, for the ecosystem. Um, 
selecting native plants. Um, really, that's going to depend on the property you own and the property you're trying to uh, improve. And bottom line, what this really all comes down to is you need to do the research. You did it. Um, there's a saying we use in the master gardener, you know, right place, right plant, right place. And basically that means not planting a shade plant in the full sun and vice versa. Or taking a sun living plant and planting in the shade. It's not going to do well. That's something you need to you need to research. Hey, what's these are natives to this area. There still are uh like pawpaw trees. Pawpaw trees are great. Everybody thinks, oh, it's a tree, it's an understory tree, meaning they I have seen them out in the full sun. They don't do well. They will they will survive, but they would be do much better under a sweet gum tree. You know, a couple of sweet gum trees providing some protection shade from that direct sunlight. Um, that, hey, there it is. Select the right plant for the right place. Let's reiterate that one. Uh, think holistically. Uh, that's each individual's choice there. Um, you know. The advice is mimic the community. You know, you got a canopy tree. That would be like a sweet gum or oak tree, uh, some of the maples, understory trees, you know, the pawpaws, the dogwoods, um, the vines, creeping, uh, Virginia creeper. Um, but be careful with Virginia creeper because about uh, 10 to 20 percent of the population is actually allergic to Virginia creeper. Has yeah, some people break out like it's poison ivy. Well, not quite as bad as poison ivy, but they, they have a, uh, allergic reactions to them, but it, it does support local wildlife, Virginia creeper. Uh, another nice thing about Virginia creeper would be like the vine look. Unlike some English ivy, which the, the roots hook in and can help tear apart things, Virginia creeper, it grows with the, I call it sticky feet. Uh, it has sticky vines that will attach, so there will be no physical damage if it grows a brick wall, like with the English ivy, where it gets into the cracks, start loosening water, and next thing you know, 20 years down the road, you have to replace the, the wall because it, it, it damages everything. Um, shrubs, you know, elderberry, uh, uh, what's the purple one? It's one with some nice purple berries that's native. I can't think of the name of it right now. Uh, I'll come on, I'm sure it's here in a slide slow, slideshow here later. Um, native herbs, ground cover, you know, there's actually with native strawberries that you can't eat, but that is um, their strawberry ground cover. What about beauty berry? Beauty berry, yes, that is the purple, yes. Um, that's exactly the one I was thinking of. I love that. Um, you know, ecological layers, you know, mulch layer. You know, believe it or not, there's a lot of activity going on in the mulch. Um, you know, there's millipedes and centipedes and uh, other little beetles and stuff in there. They're herbaceous layer, which is like your ground cover and stuff, uh, small shrubs and shrub layer than the canopy. Um, mulch layer, basically leaf litter and woody debris supports decomposers such as sow bugs, beetles, and millipedes. Hey, food for predators. Okay, now we're talking about those small predators. We talked about in the beginning. The herbaceous layer, plants with green. Non, this is your non woody stuff, stuff that's all kind of like, um, believe that, dandelion. You know, dandelion is a herbaceous layer. Uh, leaves, shoots, nectar, seeds, uh, you know, there's different heights of it. Uh, some of your grasses are that way. Shrub layer, this is where your elderberry and uh, beauty berry and blueberry would be. Um, and the canopy layer. Uh, pawpaw is in here, but pawpaw is really, like I said, it is an understory tree. That's the pawpaw on the right. That's great tasting fruit if you want to, if you want to native fruit. The <laughs> only problem is that it's a very short window of picking and, and eating it. So that's why it's never caught on to eat uh, like bananas, which are produced year long. Um, here we're going back to those butterflies we talked about. They, they must have a host plant. Meaning they, you know, for this the monarch, they have to have a monarch butterfly. This is an adult to actually get nectar from from the, the bloom. So the, uh, that's not what we're really concerned about. We're like I said, we're concerned more about the, the larval life cycle when they actually have to eat the plant, the least of the plant. Um, black cherry tree supports another type of 
and three Munamox paint lady swallowtails. Um, yeah, that looks like a swallowtail. I'm a, I'll check here in a second. I, I, I forget the name. I don't think it's a black swallowtail that the pawpaw produces, but it's we'll find out when we go here to the internet to uh, look that one up. You know, elm tree is a morning cloak uh, moth. Uh, a willow genius is a, another type of swallowtail. Um, a hackberry tree. Uh, they didn't name this. I uh, obviously didn't uh, proof this one enough. Um, top woody native plant. Okay, these are the top woody trees in, in our area. You know, oak, cherry, willow, birch, poplar, elm, pine, maple, uh, blueberry. Actually, actually, that's more shrub. Uh, and apple trees. Um, apple trees, not so much around here. Although people do have them, they just are hard to grow. Um, top herbaceous native, basically, these are your uh, non woody asters, uh, violas, violets. And I, I love that as a ground cover myself. Uh, Rubecchia. Rubecchia isn't cone flower, is it? Uh, I'll have to check an apple. Uh, geraniums. Uh, yes. Rebecca is a cone flower, really? Yeah. I did not think, I'm thinking like echinacea and stuff more along the cone flowers. Oh well. Uh, sedges, um, Joe Pye weed, um, you know, other pollinators, you know, hummingbirds. Um, in fact, hummingbirds love uh, the honeysuckles. Uh, bees, uh, bees love anything that flowers. Depending on the bees, uh, wasps. Believe it or not, wasps are actually a great pollinator. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put a little tidbit out here. If you want a great pollinating plant, mountain mint will draw everything. I'm here to say mountain mint. Yeah. We'll get all the wasps and bees. Wasps, bees, flies, and uh, it. They're just covered when it's it's going, and they. Um, the only thing with mountain mint before you go out and buy a bunch of it. Is you need to keep mountain mint checked too, because it will uh, self pollinate or not, not self pollinate, self seed prolifically. So once if you plant a section in, you put one plant in the ground one year, you end up for three or four years, you're gonna have a backyard of mountain mint. So it, it just it's easy to pull up and share though. It, it, it is, but if you if you decide to take that route, oh, I'm not gonna get it this week, and this week turns into next month, and next month turns into next year. You're going to have a lot of it. <laughs> uh, hey, look at that. There's Mountain Mint. Rattlesnake Master is another one. Uh, Golden Rod. Uh, tick Seed. Pink Tick Seed. Uh, there's Joe Pie Weed, which is a good uh, swamp milk weed. Both good pollinator. Cone fly. That's more like the Echinacea there, not the Rubecchia. Uh, Rubecchia is normally yellows. Uh, wild Bergamot. Uh, Spring plants that looks like uh, uh, can't think of the name of it right now. So it's like a toad lilies, toad lilies down here. Yeah, I'm not sure on the left. Is that blue salvia? Is that salvia? That might be salvia. I should have labeled these. That, that is columbine. This is again, I know where to find the answers, I don't necessarily know all the answers. <laughs> The pink one is Joe Pye still. Is that Joe Pye Week still? Yeah. I know this one. I can't think of the name of it right now. Obviously, a Daisy of some type, Shasta maybe. And my eyes are killing me. This looks like a golden rod. Um, blue, big blue stem is a native grass. Little blue stem, switch grass, Indian grass. Oh. We're not going to cover the pollinator habitat. Um, we're not going to cover this part because uh, this is really more into the animal side of it. Uh, these are all American holly, Virginia pine, all native. I want to get to, yeah, so oak, cherry, and poplar. The birds seem to lo love those trees. Um, the blackberry, sumac, chokeberry, the dogwood, or burnums. Hey, there's the blue beauty berry, the winter berry. Um, some of the animals do eat those seeds. Elderberry, Virginia creeper. 
And there's animals that actually eat these, eat the seeds there too. Bee it's bomb. A host, it's a host plant for um, the giant or no, the giant swallowtail. I think so. Creeper? Mm -hmm. I'll have to, or, we'll it's either a host plant second. or a, a, a plant that they eat. Trumpet honeysuckle. This is also called coral honeysuckle. I love this one. I got this in my yard. Um, hummingbirds and uh, butterflies love it. Um, foxglove, beard tongue, blue lobelia. Uh, obviously, you know, ferns and moss beds are good for uh, amphibians, lizard tail, prickle weed. Basically, these are just examples of plants for different types of habitats. Um, spider, I love spider. A lot of people don't like spider wood, but this this actual bloom will open and close as the heat of the day goes on. It's really beautiful in the spring and uh, fall. Um, we'll sell it at our plant sales at Bluebird. Uh, big blue flag iris. Not a huge plant fan of them. Um, other habitat we consider besides just a plant: brush pile, rock piles, dead trees, and wood. Uh, quick story on dead trees and woods, right? Cut down a dead tree at Bluebird Gap Farm to make a uh, critter pile, a, a, a nest pile for. Uh, I was following the Department of Forestry's guidelines. Basically, you take big logs, you know, you get smaller as you go, and you're basically making a TP effect. And um, I got pulled aside by the ranger from the city of Hampton and said, you know, you, you cut down habitat. I said, uh, I'm not thinking about it at the time because I was a new master gardener. Yeah. Uh, basically said, it's okay, I'll let you go this time. Uh, normally it's a couple hundred dollar fine, but said you you cut down habitat to make habitat is why I got off. <laughs> so it wasn't a public park. I didn't ask the I didn't have permission prior to doing it, but it's just something to think about. A dead tree that hasn't fallen, even, even if a dead tree's fallen, that's why most cities have gone to let you walk bluebird or not bluebird. If you walk the Madison Trail around the golf course, the trees that fall, they only cut the parts that come across the, they leave the trees there because it is so important for the habitat, the whole ecosystem, because there's a bunch of, um, dang, the words slip in my mouth, in my mind right now, decomposers that live off those trees. And those decomposers, those beetles and ants and stuff feed other animals. It's, Keep the ecosystem in, in balance. You know, patches of bare soil are even needed because um, there are ground bees that need to get into. If you uh, believe it or not, mulching excessively excessively in your mulch beds, um, leave leave a spot or two that's bare where for that type of insect to to live um, because they're going to be pollinators and they're going to help you, especially if you're growing uh, vegetables they'll return the favor by visiting your plants when they're in their pollination phase. Um, but if you mulch over the ground, they can't get to the ground and fertilize into the ground and make their nests. Um, now, so here's where we're going to get to off to the internet now. You have all that information at your fingertips. I'll give you a couple seconds, and I'll show one more after this and give you a few seconds to take a, to another screenshot and paste in the word or something. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next slide, and we're going to actually visit some of these sites, and I'm going to show you what's nice about these and help you determine what natives you want to grow. Um, and this is a, this digital atlas, the one that's up here now, you can actually download this on the phone and do the same thing, and it's, it's, it's a really neat app for uh, determining what's local to your area. We're going to see if this will work. Okay, um, this is a site I'll come back to so, so we don't run out of time. If we have time, we'll cover it. It's basically everything I've talked about is why uh, native plants matter. But this is from the uh, uh, Audubon Society. So you could you could look this up at your own time if you need to. It's, it's a great site for uh, talking about why the plants matter. It is basically gonna reinforce the food web concept. Um, I want to go to the digital atlas first. Okay, this is a digital atlas. Um, I like this thing. I'm just going to put, I got blueberries up here in the top right. All right. 
Uh, I'm using a common name and a scientific name. Most people don't know unless you're horticulturist. You don't know the scientific name. I couldn't vernaculum. I, I, that's blueberries. But hit the search. Now this is going to list what blueberries in the state of Virginia are native to the area. So, or to the state of Virginia. Now we're going to click on this one here at the bottom. So for that blueberry, um, it's not showing here on our screen very good, but she, you should be seeing it fine, Nancy. That blueberry, it will give you information about it. And each red dot, there's, there's the um, legend up here. Red dot shows what county or town it's native to. All right, so we'll go back one. And we're gonna hit the third one. This one's pretty much native to the whole state, I think. Yeah. So basically, here's a native blueberry that's native to the whole state. So if you if you're strictly looking for a particular blueberry that will fit in your and you want to be native, this is a great a great resource. And if we go back now, you can take this scientific name and you can now search that on the internet or ask a grower. You're specifically looking for that that strand of blueberry. Um, now, with that said, it may not be as productive as some of the stuff they're uh, selling at the box stores. Uh, you may have to go to a native nursery uh, to to get this blueberry too. But this is an app that is downloadable. It's downloadable to your phone. Works the same way. You can zoom in and zoom out. Uh, great resource. Any questions? Um, another one here, uh, just, uh, oh, this is talking about native keystone plants for wildlife. Um, it's a video that can be watched, but, uh, this is not what I was wanting to show you. Native plants. There we go. And on, on here, again, this was the National Wildlife Federation. Um, there are options on here. You can have native plant finder. They have one here um, that you can select. You want to find native plants, bam. Go here, specify a location. All right, that should be our zip code. Hit enter. Okay. And now this will bring up for our zip code. Flowers and grasses. This is it doesn't have pictures for everything, but this will be is a place where you can start to um, and we're going to view all uh, different plants. See, there's a what is that? Five only five. I don't know. Is that a number? Uh, there may only be five pages of this for native for grass. Oh no, there's more. So I don't know how, but you could go through it, and obviously they on the Wildlife Federation, they don't have everything um, pictured with the names. But it's a great resource for identifying what, what are native to the area. Um, I'm gonna close that one down. Uh, took me over there. Um, bring more birds to your home with native plants. Again, this is more geared towards if you're a bird watcher. Well, this function here would be a great function for the Audubon. Um, now here's what I here's the site I like the best, and this is the uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and this is a database for the whole U.S. Um, the plan your visit no field of lights. They hold classes. Find a plant. No, that's not. Native plants of North America. And is it is it good also, or is that the common name? That's a common name. We we'll go back here to plants in your state. All right. Um, this is. I went down to. I went here. Native plants. Search for native plants is, and it's where. Oh, this is the one I wanted. Okay. Uh, air plant name or choose plant family. Combination search. I'm sorry here. If you do a combination search, it, you can put your state in and it'll list if that's what you're looking for. Um, 
So you can either search for plants, plant lists. Um, we can select Virginia. Virginia recommended. So the, the nice thing I like about it, let's let's look for um, where is their search function? This is one thing I don't like. Okay. Where is their search function? We're going to look up Virginia Creeper because um, let's go back to search for plants. We're going to use inner plant name. And there was the spink moth. Yeah, yeah the spring, spink moth, moth, yes. Yes. Um, and the zebra swallowtail is the pawpaw. -paw. Zebra swallowtail, yes, ma'am. Not the black. Yes. Black swallowtail is like fennel and stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, Virginia creeper. So, and, and here's what I like about Lady Bird Johnson's site. All right, because it'll give up. It's it's in the great family. It'll tell you everything about it. Um, gives you the USDA symbol, which really we most people won't care about. It'll tell you about the plant, and it will also list uh, where it's at the benefit. All right. Um, and it will sit here and list butterflies and moths in North America. So and there is the it's a little larval host again, all right, uh, of the the Virginia creeper sphinx moth. So um, and this this site is just I think the best site I've come across would give you detailed information. So if you're looking for something specific, then that's the uh, this would be my go-to site. Um, now, when I'm just talking about whether it's native to this area, I like the digital atlas site because that gives you little red dots. Hey, yeah, it's native to Hampton or it's native to Newport News, whatever area you're talking about. So um, those are the two sites I use the most. Uh, I've heard about the Audubon site many times. I personally don't use it much, but um, it's just another asset that's out there. So when you're trying to determine what you want to put in your yard, um, you know, the, the Lady Bird Johnson will sit here in growing conditions. Okay, water use is low, light requirement, sun, part shade or shade. Yeah, it'll grow, creeper grow almost anywhere. All right, it'll tell you what you need to the best place for you to make a decision whether that's the right plant for the right place in your yard. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share at this point and take any questions if you have any questions, Ms. Nancy. Mm -hmm.